Thank you, everyone. Um, Bob uh, said, my name is uh, Bruce Burwell. I'm going to be talking about uh, industrial integrated project delivery today. I2PD, Mike touched on it uh, in his presentation. Gentlemen, we're ready anytime you are. Can you we're see not hearing you, we're seeing your slide. You're not hearing us? Uh, I can hear okay. Uh, Robert, I wonder if you have a slight delay in your network connection. I'm also hearing. Still not uh, hearing you, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm. Only I'm, I'm actually slide. hearing. Okay, one moment. I'll uh, I'll contact uh, Robert by chat. Okay, sir. Sure. We'll, we'll keep going then. Okay, so uh, today's agenda. Uh, we're going to walk you through it. Uh, why I2PD? We're going to talk about uh, a little about the evolution of the contracting methods the history of I2PD, uh, our CII research, including the, the principles, uh, collaboration and integration methods, uh, implementation of I2PD, uh, and, so, and some of the, the tools, including the multi-party agreement, um, how costs are uh, established, and the, the uh, some of the critical success factors uh, that we've, uh, we've witnessed and determined and then we'll uh, we'll summarize uh, with a few golden nuggets. And at the end, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, our pilot uh, project uh, program in phase two of our research. Uh, Mike and I are going to be uh, sharing this presentation, uh, so I'll I'll kick things off, and then the middle part of the presentation, uh, Mike will go through a number of slides, and then we'll wrap things up and take questions. Okay, next slide. So I'd like to start the, uh, some of these presentations uh, with this quote uh, from Alan Shepard. Um, and he said, it's a, it's a very sobering feeling uh, to be up in space and realize that one safety factor was determined by the lowest bidder on a government contract. Uh, it's very fitting for, uh, for these collaborative type uh, contracting models um, at the onset you may or may not be taking or selecting uh, the lowest, uh, the lowest price, the the lowest proposal, uh, the lowest, the lowest bid. Um, but one of the key uh, weightings uh, in making your selection uh, would be uh, would be culture uh, and the best culture fit for a collaborative type model. Next slide, Mike. So why I2PD? Uh, Mike talked a little bit about the uh, commercial IPD in his presentation, you know, and, uh, and commercial IPD mitigating uh, design risk. Um, he also talked about infrastructure and alliancing, where um, you're you're mitigating construction risk, and and we're seeing and we're we're feeling and it's been established with uh, I2PD um, that these these infrastructure type projects, uh, whether it be brownfield or, or, or greenfield, industrial type projects, excuse me, have both uh, design risk and construction risk. And, and this model um, you know, is, has been adapted to address both of the design and, and uh, construction uh, risks that these projects uh, would experience. And, um, across the bottom there, there's a there's a number of uh, you know uh, number of items that uh, this type of contracting model um, is it generates and and uh, enhances um, you know from collaborative uh, next generation environment you know our younger uh, project practitioners you know it's it's uh, you know built right into their DNA uh, to collaborate uh, with one another. Okay, sometimes, uh, you know, senior, senior PMs uh, are set, uh, set in their traditional ways, uh, whereas the younger generation, uh, not so much. And uh, I'm not gonna read you uh, all, of the, all of the bullets there, uh, but each, each one of these uh, bullets will be addressed throughout the presentation. So the uh, contracting evolution, you know, um, we've we've all we've all used, we've all experienced uh, 
you know, these, these contracting models throughout our careers, uh, design, bid, build, uh, you know, they're bilateral contracts where the owner is, is, is pushing that risk onto our contractor, on, onto our contractor friends. Um, you know, uh, as, as an owner, uh, we pay to, to uh, push those risks onto, onto our vendors and onto, onto our contractors. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a culture that's generated uh, as protectionism and what's best for me uh, versus uh, what's best for what's best for project, and it's a win-lose approach. You know, um, you're out for uh, for yourself. You're out uh, for number one. Uh, through the middle, you know, EPC or, or design uh, build type uh, models. Uh, sure, they may use some uh, uh, some of those methods. You know, early involvement of, of key stakeholders, maybe uh, maybe uh, ECI or early involvement of uh, contractors. You know, front end planning and 3D modeling are, are partnering sessions. Um, but again, they're, they're uh, you know, transactional contracts versus relational contracts of, uh, of I2PD, which uh, is over on the, the far right bubble there. You know, utilizing multi-party agreements, uh, you know, everybody uh, sinks or swims uh, together, um, you know, it applies a number of the the lean methods, uh, lean methods and tools, um, but instead of uh, a best for me culture, it's uh, it's what's uh, best for project culture. Okay? So through collaboration and integration, and you know, a very very sound uh, open communication, uh, that level of trust uh, starts to build and start and starts to increase. And through our research and, and through our, our project uh, experience, uh, we're, we're seeing in, in improved uh, KPIs and, and safety, uh, early cost of schedule certainty, um, but uh, also in uh, design optimization. So design bid build, you know, it, it's, it intentionally separates uh, the owner designer um, contractor and like I said it's 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 a pushing of risk uh, versus uh, a sharing of risk um, EPC or design uh, design build uh, we, we put the contractors and the designers uh, together um, but uh, owners owners are still segregated uh, from those two uh, those two partners whereas in I2PD uh, everybody's uh, everybody's in the sandbox together. Everybody's playing together, and everybody is is uh, sharing uh, of that risk. So and and when and this won't happen right out of the gate. Um, you know that level of trust. Um, but as as the the team, uh, the parties who collectively make the team, as as they begin to you know, protect one another uh, and have one another's back, you'll, you'll uh, witness uh, and observe that level of trust uh, ratcheting up uh, over time. Next slide, Mike. So where, where did I2PD come from? Uh, you know, the history of uh, I2PD. Uh, alliancing, um, as Mike mentioned, has been around for 30 years. Started in the North Sea and migrated to uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, commercial IPD has been around for a number uh, number of years as well. So we've taken both of those collaborative contracting models um, and 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 put them together um, and and utilized a number of the principles and a number of the methods uh, that uh, Mike is going to talk about uh, a few slides from now. Um, to create this uh, collaborative uh, contracting model that's uh, performance-based um, versus a transactional uh, model. So, you know, as, as the, uh, the outcome of the project um, certainly determines uh, the success of, of the team and ultimately this, the success of the individual parties that make up that I2PD team. Mike's slide. Okay, so 
as we talked about uh, earlier this morning, and as Bruce just mentioned, uh, uh, IQPD it was an outgrowth of a CI research project looking at why collaborative contracting hadn't caught on in the industrial space. So um, we spent about a year looking at uh, all the various uh, industry papers and, and research papers on the elements of alliancing and IPD. Um, and we looked at the contracts, we looked at the use, we looked at the success rates. Um, and then when we came to a conclusion, it was now time to go out and talk to the industrial space once the, uh, the research team uh, had collected enough data. And we put together a pretty intensive uh, questionnaire that asked the participants to look back over their career and answer the survey based on the most collaborative project that they had achieved in their career. And, you know, they, we targeted senior project managers, the average age, or sorry, the average years of experience of the project managers and executives was 29 years. And um, as we uh, went through that survey, that we followed the survey up with, you know, 20 case studies and some, some deep uh, in-person interviews uh, to gather more data uh, to, to help begin the analysis process to see what, what it was about collaborative contracting or alliancing um, that may have been a barrier for uh, the industrial projects, uh, what elements of uh, IPD and uh, Alliancing, were they using in, in, in their most collaborative contracts and what was their experience? Were they successful, not successful? Um, and then we identified the top performance metrics uh, uh, with these respondents to determine project success. And there was 14 metrics that came out of that. And these ones here, safety, quality, client satisfaction, and cost and schedule certainty were, were the, 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 the top uh, KPIs. So that was the study. And it was, uh, it was a lot of effort to put that together. And we, we uh, in the research team, we waited uh, while well, the academics did their job of analyzing the data. And they came back to us. We met in Dallas uh, at uh, one of the research uh, company's uh, head office, a uh, large pipeline company. And with a little bit of prep, they put this slide up and they said, this is the results of the survey. Each dot represents one of the 85 projects. And on the y-axis, um, um, you have average performance. And on the x-axis, you have collaboration and integration index. And we'll talk a little bit more about in, in a slide or two. And so based on the answers to the questions, their performance was plotted against collaboration and, and integration index, which is essentially how many of the collaboration and integration tools did you use and what level of intensity did you use them? And it's an interesting graph when you look at it, right? Um, they, we all looked at it and then they said, do you notice anything? And literally we had what was called our aha moment. Um, looked at it and we said, wow, the bottom right-hand corner is empty. Um, hang on a sec. I'm getting, there we go. I just have to change the plug here or we'll go offline very quickly. Okay. Hmm. Bruce, can you go into my office on my desk? There's another one of these. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that, folks. Just have to change uh, battery charges here on my laptop. So we noticed that the bottom right-hand corner uh, was empty, and you know, essentially, that as collaboration and index, uh, collaboration and, and integration index increased, the success rates of projects can 
increased. And so we added, well, we added the academics added for us a uh, little bit of simple statistical analysis. And what we saw was uh, that as you applied a mean, um, that the mean performance was 3.8 in terms of project performance for, for the data set we had of the 85 projects. And the mean uh, collaboration index across all projects was 14. Then as I did a little bit, a little bit more statistics, um, we saw that when you provide, uh, uh, took a look at the quartile performance, uh, performance at 3.5%, and the 75% quartile of CI index in that quarter, there's absolutely no um, oh, sorry, it's the other one. Um, absolutely no uh, projects that were uh, below the 3.5 success rate. And so that led us to conclude that there's a strong correlation between increased collaboration index and project performance on projects that used high levels of collaboration and integration. In other words, high performance certainty uh, as you moved up the CI uh, integration index. Um, and you know, the conclusion we came after digesting this is that collaboration plus integration at the right levels equals certainty across a number of KPIs. So another way to look at that same data is what you see on the left-hand side, when you're below a certain level, below actually uh, 15 there, you see that there's random success and, uh, or failure. And for those elements in terms of the survey, that, those projects in terms of the survey that we looked at, uh, the successful projects, we couldn't find a reason that they were successful. We had some instincts, but the data didn't show that. And there was a slight correlation with respect to poor leadership and project uh, failure. And the good news is that uh, we're back and powered up. So what we found in looking at the research is that it's a minimum of 15 of the principles and methods used with the right intensity level um, Put you up in that uh, green CI index quadrant, and so that was the that was the core nut of the research. I mean, at, at this point, we still didn't have I2PD, but we we had something that we looked at. What we realized was that we had to take the collaboration principles, the C and the CI index, uh, those five principles that you see there, and then the four uh, integration principles from alliancing uh, and put them together and create what we call the CI index. And if you want more, much more detail on, on this and just to see how the research went through this, take a look at the research paper published by CII. It does a great job of explaining this in more detail than we typically have time for in these presentations. Um, and then the object is putting them together and you end up with what we believe are the nine core principles for um, I2PD, um, the joining of collaboration, which enhances design optimization and integration that, in, that uh, enhances risk, construction risk mitigation. I talked earlier this morning, this is a better slide than the one before, about the collaboration and integration methods. Uh, so there's 21 of them. There's no magic to these. People have been using them for years. Um, we haven't invented anything new. Um, but what we found is that these methods support the, uh, the application of the principles. And again, in the research study, there's a great chart that shows how the interrelationship between this, the principles and the methods. Um, so as we put it together, we were looking for a metaphor. I like my my recipe metaphor that I came up with uh, a while back and I shared with you earlier this morning, but the metaphor was that of the Parthenon, probably one of the best examples of design optimization and at the time, 
construction risk management. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of heavy stones layered on top of each other. And, you know, the outcome was perfect. And so each of the pillars represents the uh, IQPD principles. Uh, they set on top of that foundation I talked about, the intense collaboration and integration using enough of the collaboration and integration to get to that uh, success ratio that we're talking about. Um, those principles um, help build the business case for the project from, from, from the early uh, participation of key suppliers and developing the validation phase to the pre-construction phase. I'm not sure what happened there. And, and so this is the, um, and as you move up, the, uh, the key here is as you move up and start using these principles, as Bruce talked about, you continue to build trust. And trust is a key foundational element. Uh, trust begets communication and collaboration. Um, one of the things we looked at as we booked, I think I'm going back to Bruce. Yeah. Actually, go back to uh, slide 11. Mike. I'm just going to add a couple more points here. This one. Okay. So back in, back in 2018, I was I was representing Ontario Power Generation uh, on this research team, um, and back in 2018, I was still uh, working for Ontario Power Generation before I retired. But when we saw the results uh, of these of this uh, survey and, and the, uh, the the 20 case studies that uh, Mike was talking about. Um, it was it was extremely compelling, uh, you know, not just to myself but all of us in the room, and and you know that was uh, about the time that I started to socialize uh, I2PD within OPG. And Allison's going to talk uh, and present um, a little bit about. Um, uh, OPG and, and the auto holding case study. So I, I don't want to steal you know, a bunch of uh, her content uh, that she's going to share. Um, but but you know in in our organization, you know uh, EPC and design design bid build and some design build, they were the the go to uh, contracting models. Um, but when we saw the results of, of this survey, um, you know, uh, I said to myself, you know, why are we going down the same path over and over again? So, and, and I asked our senior executives in, the, in a meeting one day, and, you know, I asked them if they were happy with the way we were executing work. Don't get me wrong. You know, we had a lot of successful projects. Um, and, but we also had projects, personally, I also had projects that you want to erase from your memory. And us uh, project uh, practitioners, if, if we're, you know, if we're saying it, or if we're indicating that all the projects that we've executed, planned and executed over, over our career have all been successful, um, I would probably call you out uh, because, uh, because I know I've had some projects that were very, very trying at times. So I asked, uh, I asked our senior execs, our COO, and our, and our president, you know, are you are you happy with the way that we're executing um, executing our work? And and the answer was, you know, the answer wasn't a hard no, um, but you know, could we improve? Um, so it was at that point where I said, well, um, if if you are happy with the way that we're uh, executing our projects, um, we'll just continue doing what we're doing. Uh, so it was at that point where it started to it started to pick up some uh, some momentum about implementing uh, I2PD uh, into OPG, and I'll let Allison uh, later this afternoon uh, take you through through that journey. Um, but you know, it takes a willingness. You know, uh, on behalf of an of an owner, to um, to take that that step um, or that level of risk into doing uh, you know 
doing things differently or doing things outside of the norm. It's very, very comfortable to do things uh, the same way over and over again. Um, but it, it, it takes, you know, it takes an element of, of risk and, and, uh, and great leadership um, to say, let's try this. And uh, I forget, it might have been Richard uh, yesterday uh, mentioned about pilots, you know, uh, and picking a pilot project, you know, just to dip your toes, I'll say, um, you know, don't, t don't pick a, you know, a big risky uh, career limiting project, uh, but a project that, uh, you know, you're, you're comfortable with and, and uh, stakeholders that you're, you're comfortable working with as well. Okay, back to the presentation. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the implementation and, and some of these tools that were that were uh, generated and and were deliverables from phase one of our research. Um, and one of the tools was the uh, the maturity model, the I2B maturity model, and and it measures the level of of, of maturity with collaboration and integration um, amongst uh, amongst your your organization. And you know uh, the expectation of the results uh, from a, a maturity assessment when you uh, when you when you run it through um, don't have high expectations. Um, you know the the likelihood you'll be down in the in the high ones or or early two uh, stages. Um, but as as you mature with the with the process. Um, within an individual uh, project, or perhaps through a, through a program, um, you, you your team will will will, will want to run uh, the maturity model uh, a number of times uh, through that project, and you should see that steady progression um, as as you you move from a stage one ad hoc um, through to a stage four or, or possibly even a stage five of, uh, continuous improvement. Uh, okay. So Mike talked about the 21, uh, uh, methods, uh, the top 21 methods that our research had identified. We also identified, uh, the, the level of effort and, uh, and the impact, uh, that these, these methods will bring to your organization when utilized uh, at the right, uh, and Mike used the word intensity, okay? So, you know, uh, a, a multi-party agreement or a shared risk reward scheme or joint risk assessment, you know, is has high impact, um, but it takes a, a greater level of effort to implement uh, versus, you know, some of the, some of the lower, uh, methods, uh, standardized process, alternate or pull schedule, pull planning, um, and this sort of thing. Um, but, but the rewards, uh, with, uh, with the implementation of, uh, you know, joint risk assessment, and I'm going to talk about it a, a little bit later, uh, the rewards um, to the project, um, is, is greatly increased. Next slide, Mike. So the, the multi-party agreement, uh, th this was also a deliverable of the phase one of our research. And, and what we did was we, we took uh, some templates from commercial IPD and, and, and some uh, contracting templates from uh, infrastructure and alliancing and, and also uh, an EPC agreement. And we started to to take the three agreements and 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 mold them into what was the outcome um, of this multi-party agreement. You know, the first time we in, implemented implemented it uh, was with the OPG Auto Holden project, which Allison is going to to talk about uh, a little later on. That that agreement or that template, uh, I will say was vetted by a number of commercial and, and legal representatives uh, amongst that team, um, plus, plus our research team, uh, our academics, and our, our uh, legal um, team members. Okay? And that's, uh, that's how this multi-party agreement uh, was, was crafted. 
Now, will, will this agreement fit uh, every project? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, it's, it's a template that will have to be made fit for purpose uh, for your particular organization um, or, or your uh, particular project. But what I will say is, is the, the heavy lifting ha has been done and, and the template now is, is available uh, and, uh, for other organizations uh, to utilize. So we're saying there's three elements to uh, you know uh, an I, I2PD project, yeah. and and I particularly rank them in in this order. Behaviors is 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 right at the top. Okay, creating that one team approach through a collaboration and integrative uh, team. Uh, communication uh, communication is absolutely key. Open communication. Um, you know, in the, in those uh, big room activities, uh, you know, there's there's very very uh, trying and hard conversations at times. Um, but nobody nobody's picking on a certain individual or or a certain organization. Um, but you're you're trying to uh, you know you're trying to remove layers and layers and layers of duplication. Um, you know that will again the 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 main premise here is what is what's best for project um, so communication is is absolutely a must open communication and as you, you know, converse uh, with one another um, as I said earlier that that level of trust uh, will start to will start to increase uh, it's a flat structure Okay, it's not higher hierarchical. Um, you know, you want to you want to drive down the decision making uh, process to the to the lowest possible uh, levels um, to uh, increase efficiencies in uh, in in planning and and making those uh, make, making those decisions uh, in tap in a timely fashion. Okay. Um, you want to set the uh, the project goals. You want to set the values. You know what does a, what does a successful project look like? Okay. Uh, the process we talked about early collaboration, okay, but it also aligns uh, the business interests of, of, of not just with within the owners organization, but the the uh, the I two B D team uh, as well. Um, designing the budget. You know, we're all accustomed to writing a specification, putting it out on the street, getting back in our hands a, a fixed price, and then we build our budgets uh, from those, uh, you know, proposals that we uh, that we receive. Um, in this case, uh, we have we have a set budget. Okay? Well, maybe maybe not maybe not a set budget, but we we have a budget, and we're trying to design, um, you know, with with the with the objective of meeting the uh, meeting those specifications, uh, we're trying to uh, design a, a particular piece of equipment, facility, whatever, uh, to that budget. The lean principles uh, techniques. I'm not going to go through that again. Um, you know, like Mike said, we didn't invent these things, um, but you know, uh, the combination of those methods. Uh, and and those principles. Uh, once you get above uh, CI index of 15 at the right intensity, uh, the likelihood of your project succeeding uh, increases immensely. And then the contract itself, uh, the you know putting uh, putting the project first uh, instead of yourself or your uh, your your particular organization by aligning the objectives. And the incentive, and the incentives, um, you know, uh, with the with with the sharing of risk, um, in with with the with the goal of a successful project, and a successful project then means that uh, all of the parties uh, within uh, that multi-party agreement uh, or or the uh, the project itself uh, will will also be rewarded uh, with success. 
uh, full transparency to cost, and then uh, balanced risk re uh, reward scheme. So how is the estimate developed? Okay. So the, the cost, um, allowable costs, chargeables, uh, costs, uh, overheads, uh, again, is, is fully open book. Um, when, whenever you're making your selection of your I2PD team, you know, there, there will be organizations that uh, will, will have some pushback uh, as far as open book. Right? Um, and these, these are, you know, great organizations that you will probably work with many, many more times again. Um, but this type of model may not be a good fit uh, for those organizations. Uh, this type of model may not be uh, in, their, in their culture, in their DNA, um, and they may take exception uh, to open book. Uh, but there, there will be others that, you know, when you're going through your selection process, it becomes very, very evident, uh, especially during the the interview process. Um, you know, who who's a gamer, and who actually, you know, is putting everything out on the table uh, for the other team members uh, to see uh, and to share. Okay, uh, equitable uh, risk sharing. Okay? So you're all in this together. You're, you're, you're building one risk register. It's, a, it's an integrated risk register. Okay. Um, the intent here is to, to, to preserve uh, that contingency um, by, by being uh, your brother's keeper, uh, by, by working together and when issues arise, and, and we're not saying there's not gonna be any issues. Um, absolutely, there, there could be issues. Um, but we're saying as, as a team, um, we, there's a greater chance of, of uh, addressing, mitigating, uh, closing of those issues uh, long before they, they fester into you know, a very, very costly uh, mistake or, or costly um, outcome uh, for the project. And then on top of it is, is your profit. Again, it's open book. Um, you know, uh, if the if the project is successful, and I'm going to talk about this a, a little bit more in the in the next slide, um, you know that that profit is is uh, you know is an equitable is also an equitable share, not equal, um, of that uh, preserved uh, contingency or risk pool. Next slide, Mike. So here's here's three scenarios. Uh, profit scenarios on the, on the far right, uh, above the target cost, um, you, you've exceeded the target cost, you've, you've eroded um, all of the contingency funding, and now you're, you're eating into, into your profit um, at, the, at the end of the project. You know, uh, below target cost on, on the left-hand side, um, you've brought the you've brought the project in uh, ahead of schedule or or, or under budget. Um, you you've preserved all of your contingency, so you get you get a shared portion of, of that contingency or risk pool, and you get 100% uh, uh, of your profit. Uh, in the middle there, if the, if the project goes uh, exactly as planned, uh, you have some uh, known unknowns that. Uh, that have creeped into your project. Uh, you have uh, spent all of your all of your contingency, but you preserved 100% of your profit. So these are some of the uh, critical success factors that uh, that we found, uh, not just with the with the research, uh, but uh, projects that uh, we've been involved in. You know, you, you need a team that's uh, committed to the project. And I talked about setting those, those values uh, early on. Um, cultivating that uh, environment of trust. Um, you know, when you're selecting your, not just your, your proponents uh, that will, you know, form the I2PD team, but your internal team uh, as well. Um, you, you, want, you want to select members that, you know, 
have the proper mindset that aren't stuck in those traditional uh, means and ways. Uh, throughout the validation phase, we, we have found, yes, there, there are times when you are going to, to slip back into the, those traditional mindsets. Um, and that's, uh, that's where, you know, you have to you know, hit the pause button and, and pull yourself uh, out of that uh, traditional mindset um, and 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 go back to okay this we're making these decisions for the project um, and not uh, and not uh, for our, for ourselves and and you know just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean that we're actually going to do it this way uh, for for this particular project um, decision makers I talked about drilling down uh, the the approval process down to the lowest uh, possible level. Uh, your willingness to adapt. Okay. Some of the some of the systems, some of the tools uh, that you're you're accustomed to using um, may not uh, be the tool that's selected uh, for this particular project. You're you're selecting a tool or you're selecting a system uh, within the project uh, within that team. That's best suited for the team and best suited for the for the project. Open book. I talked about. I don't have to. I don't have to say that uh, anymore. Ex <coughs> executive support uh, with the with the auto holding project. Uh, there was uh, executive support uh, right out of the gate. Uh, you know, they there was a full commitment uh, to run the that I2PD uh, pilot project, and and what we found during the during some of the presentations, the proponent presentations, uh, some of the proponents uh, brought their executive team with them, uh, and their their executive team didn't didn't uh, you know sit in the, in a boardroom like Mike and I are sitting right here uh, as figureheads. Uh, they carried the conversation uh, during those presentations. So we we knew that there was a, a number of organizations that you know were were engaged. Uh, with this collaborative type of, uh, of contract. Uh, early participation in the design phase, you know, having the contractors sit alongside of the, of the uh, design team or the engineering team, identifying constructability issues is, is a huge, uh, huge benefit uh, to the project. You know, we've, we've all heard ECI, uh, early contractor involvement, um, but designing out of uh, issues is way more uh, efficient than uh, contractors mobilizing to site and uh, and redesigning um, once uh, once they're in uh, site conditions. Lessons learned. Mike talked a, a little bit uh, about lessons learned. Reach out to organizations that uh, have uh, I2PD uh, or collaborative. Uh, type uh, experience um, you know two of the key lessons uh, were uh, were uh, reaching out to those organizations that uh, you know uh, are are mature in the process and also hire yourself a facilitator and coach those those were the two um, top uh, lessons okay uh, next slide Mike <clears throat> So some uh, some takeaways uh, from from this uh, presentation, I2PD presentation. Okay, uh, it increased. Uh, we find uh, it increased certainty. Okay, um, you you can start projects that you know your scope isn't one hundred percent nailed down. You may think that you have specifications that are uh, airtight um, and issue them for <clears throat> EPC agreements or, or models or design build models, uh, but uh, the likelihood uh, of those agreements being airtight, well, <clears throat> we've all been down that road. Okay. We're not saying uh, I2PD is a fit for every project, absolutely not. Okay. Um, but what we are saying is, is uh, you know, for those projects where scope isn't fully defined, uh, this may be a, a a good alternative that you may want to look at. Protects our contractors. Uh, contractors are our friends. We're not in the business to put contractors out of business. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, we want them to be successful. If our contractors are successful, um, you know, um, ourselves as owners uh, are successful and our projects are, are successful. Um, you know, the, the model is set up to incentivize uh, um, those parties within, uh, within that multi-party agreement. Right? How that <clears throat> in, uh, incentive model is, is developed, um, it's, it's uh, project specific. Allison is going to run you through uh, a model that uh, that she's using, okay. um, and fostering that collaborative uh, environment. You know, it, it was mentioned uh, yesterday. Um, it'll probably be mentioned uh, more today. Um, it's more enjoyable uh, to work within this type of model um, instead of a transactional model. Uh, especially if you have two PMs uh, that you know are, are going like uh, headbutting, um, you're you're working in a model uh, as a as a team model, and it's not uh, G, GC member, it's not uh, engineering member, it's not owner member, um, it's it's team member. Okay. So uh, you know, Mike talked a little bit about uh, project success. You know, we're we're seeing. Uh, early uh, cost and schedule certainty uh, on some of these projects. Okay? Um, whenever, I, whenever I was socializing uh, I2PD uh, back in my OPG days, I did ask our, our senior execs, um, you know, what would make them happy if we did run this uh, particular project. And we hadn't, our model, and we hadn't picked a, uh, a, a project at that time. Okay? But once we did, you know, I said, what would make you happy? They, they said, Bruce, tell me how much and tell me how long. That's it. Okay. So they were, you know, uh, OPG was looking for cost and schedule certainty. And with this type of model, you know, coming out of the validation phase, you will have, uh, you will have that benefit of uh, integrated schedule, integrated cost, and integrated uh, estimate, integrated risk plan. Okay. Uh, the, there's, you know, there's other elements uh, and outputs uh, with the that validation exercise, uh, but coming out of that validation exercise and knowing how much and how long is 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 a great benefit, uh, not just for the owner but for the uh, our contractor friends as well. Next slide, Mike. Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit about the research. Uh, the The initial research team was 383, and Mike talked about uh, 341. Or, sorry, 341, <clears throat> and that was phase one of the research. Uh, and uh, you know the the tools that uh, I had mentioned and, uh, and the surveys that that Mike presented they they were all outputs from uh, from 341. And there is there is approximately 20. Uh, as team members uh, on that. Uh, CII um, has, has uh, given the approval um, to go into phase two of this research. Uh, we've been in phase two of the research uh, for a little over a year now where we want to uh, we want to validate our findings from, from phase phase one on, on live um, I2PD uh, pilot projects. You know, we're <clears throat> the the pilot pro, uh, project program is not only open or, uh, to CII member companies, but uh, outside member companies as well. Uh, for example, uh, we've invited uh, COA uh, to participate uh, in the research, um, and and you know other other uh, non CII member companies. Uh, there is a mechanism in our in our charter to bring in uh, non-member, non-CII member companies uh, into the research. So, um, if uh, if anybody's uh, interested or, or wants more information, uh, you know, reach out to reach out to Bob, our, our, our moderator, uh, or Mike or myself, and we we be, be glad to provide you for, uh, some additional information. And I think that's it. So back to you, Bob. Are 
You're on mute, Bob. Can't hear you, Bob. Mic check, Bob. Bob, you're muted. Having some audio trouble. Audio trouble. Just give Mike uh, or Robert a moment here. Sure. <clears throat> No luck there, Robert. Can you hear us? You can. Yeah. Okay. Check your uh, connection with your. Um, maybe try unplugging your headset. Maybe you'll have some success there. Could be interfering. Hmm. Okay. Did you want to try? Uh, uh, we can. We can read these. Sure. Yeah. If if Robert. Uh, if you want to try dropping and rejoining while uh, they start the Q&A. Sorry about this. That's okay. I'll take this first one. Like, sure. Okay. So the question is, uh, what are the timelines required to create an effective I2PD relationship? Uh, how far ahead of plan construction start uh, should should the process start? Okay. That's, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's in Allison's uh, presentation this afternoon, so I don't want to steal, uh, you know, uh, a great deal of her uh, of her thunder, uh, but what I what I will say, and I mentioned it uh, during my presentation that you know um, you you can start the the I2BD process uh, before your scope is 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 fully um, fully um, developed. Okay? Um, you know the timelines okay? and. Allison, Allison has a graph that uh, that she's going to that she's going to share with you. Uh, but I, what I will say that you know once a once a contracting model has been selected uh, by the owner, um, you know your your procurement folks, uh, your 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 PM, uh, your your project sponsor. Once that model has been selected, uh, it's very very difficult um, to reverse that course. I'm not saying it, it can't happen, um, but uh, I'm saying it's to get uh, internal consensus uh, to reverse course uh, is a lot more difficult than than taking a look at your your present project portfolio, uh, the tool, the selection tool that Mike talked about. Um, it's it's currently in draft form right now. We, we're running a number of projects uh, through that uh, selection tool with uh, with a number of organizations, and we're we're you know we're we're targeting potential um, I2PD projects with within a portfolio um, of, of perhaps this uh, contracting model would be would be most effective. Anything bad, Mike? No, that's good. Bob, you back? <clears throat> I'm back. <clears throat> Whatever happened. Uh, the second question here is, were the achievements, uh, 3.5 cost savings, through collaborative contracts achieved with parallel implementation of AWP principles or independent of AWP? So uh, the research reports that uh, Bruce quoted uh, were independent of AWP. And as a matter of fact, in the coming weeks, we are starting our first IQPD project using AWP construction planning uh, best practice. And we're putting the two together as, as was talked about yesterday. And we think we will see additive uh, results out of that. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, and that's a project that uh, runs and will be fully executed and implemented about this time next year. Good. So when projects are over the intended cost, many companies typically don't accept no profit and and finger pointing starts. How do you address that in the contract? If you're in a supplier's market uh, with limited number of suppliers, that's hard to overcome if the market chooses not to play. Uh, we heard that answer yesterday. Um, so in starting down this path, Talk to your supplier friends. Call, uh, as we said yesterday, talk to them about your intentions. 
And uh, you'll be surprised at how many are, would, will be willing in advance before the contracts are let, while they're still in that competitive mindset, will be willing to put all of their, 100% of their profits at risk in exchange, and this is key, for an equitable share in the savings. If the owner wants to keep all the savings, it's not going to work. And right, the, the, the owner needs to focus on what they really want. And if they're looking for cost and schedule certainty, and they want their supplier friends to work with them in a co collaborative mode, they should expect that the lion's share, not all, but the lion's share of the savings are distributed equitably to the uh, team members that help get them to where they wanted to be. The, the only thing uh, I will add to that is you're making your selection um, you know, of those proponents. Uh, again, back to that, my opening slide there. Um, you're not selecting you're not selecting proponents that may be of the lowest price um, but you're you're selecting proponents um, based on culture yeah. sure they're all technically sound why would you invite them to uh, to, to the dance if they weren't uh, technically sound um, but but culture uh, culture you know are they are they going to play well in the sandbox uh, are they going to sink or swim uh, together uh, that is one of the the very very uh, you know key components of, of uh, making your making your selection, and that will mitigate exactly that finger pointing. Yeah, I'm not saying that's not going to happen, um, but it will it'll certainly mitigate that finger pointing uh, once uh, issues arise uh, down the road in your contract. Back back to your aha moment scatter chart for projects in that upper right. Did they have a common scope or magnitude? Were they all small or large cap projects? A mix? So the projects varied in size. Some of the smallest ones were in a couple of them in the half million dollar range. Uh, several of them were uh, above $15 billion. So scope and scale varied greatly. Um, and all 85 respondents covered all five sectors within CII. So we had respondents from each of the five sectors. So oil and gas, mining and minerals, power and utilities, facilities and healthcare, and I'm probably gonna forget one, chemicals and downstream. I think I got them. Good. Uh, is it possible to have an effective IPD without no claims or without shared risk and reward? Me, yeah, I'll, I'll kick this one off, uh, and Mike will uh, follow up. Um, <clears throat> I think it's possible to have a IPD-ish, uh, you know, contracting model applying, you know, a number of those uh, principles and methods, um, not just in in uh, in an IPD project, um, but you know, those, those principles and methods can be applied in a in a traditional model itself you know if there's a if an organization um you know wants to you know adapt uh, adopt sorry adopt uh, you know the those those methods in a in a i2pd ish or ipd ish uh, uh, type of of uh, contract or, or scenario um yes it can certainly be uh, it, can, it can certainly be uh, you know implemented. Um, but what I will say though is when when our contractor friends uh, are putting their their profits at risk um, for a share of that risk savings, and they're all integrated together in that risk pool, it drives uh, it drives that. Uh, the, the right culture from the onset. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions here. Uh, is there a terms and conditions document for I2PD companies uh, in, uh, to use in their in-house construction agreement templates? So uh, as part of the delivery for um, the uh, phase one research, uh, um, 
in working with OPG, the research team, and lots of legal beagles, we put together a comprehensive EPC contract added on elements of uh, IPD from uh, lo looking at uh, uh, various uh, forms of agreement and looking at various clauses that came out of various alliancing agreements. And they were all put together to follow that uh, model um, that uh, was developed uh, uh, that resulted in those nine principles. So we were, we were looking for agreements that one, answered the basic fundamental questions for the industrial project, the EPC. Um, and what we found with the alliance contracts and the um, uh, IPD templates is they didn't have enough of the meat and potatoes that you'd expect in a, in a large industrial project. So yes, it does exist. Uh, as a member of CII, it, you're, it's available to you. Um, so if you're not a member, think, think about joining. We have a question from a, a federal government uh, a construction group. Uh, an I2PD multi-party type agreement contract I'll take this is one. unlikely to be accepted by procurement leadership. What are implementation options? Okay, I, I get this question a lot. Okay. So my initial response is, you know, um, for those that don't know, uh, Ontario Power Generation is is it a provincially owned crown corporation so if if we collectively uh, our opg team uh, could implement i2pd and a multi-party agreement um, into that organization it can be implemented into any organization okay? um, but one one of the the uh, mandates um, that i received when we implemented uh, i2pd was you know, we had to fit the model within our existing uh, procurement governance, uh, within our existing uh, procurement, our, our existing uh, uh, project and uh, contract management uh, governance. Yeah. If it didn't fit, uh, we we weren't going to implement it. Uh, so, you know, bringing in procurement, um, legal uh, risk early in in those discussions. And in identifying uh, means and ways how we could implement uh, this type of contracting model within a, a public uh, organization uh, was also one of the key uh, benefits uh, for that pilot for that pilot project. We didn't have the answers uh, back then. Uh, we needed the support um, of, of procurement and, and risk and legal and and we. We needed uh, their assistance and help and guidance in, in how we were going to uh, to not only select which project, uh, help select uh, which project, um, but all of the all of the templates because we started from a, a blank sheet of paper from the from the agreement uh, scorecarding. Uh, we did use traditional uh, specifications. Um, but uh, but the 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 remainder of the RFP documents were pretty well fit for purpose uh, for that uh, particular uh, pilot project. So uh, the answer or the question, uh, you know, unlikely. Um, I would I would argue that I I would say it's not unlikely, um, but it will take it will take some. Um, orientation it'll take some training uh, it'll it'll take those that are providing uh, you support um, to understand what i2pd uh, is um, and and the the process um, and and finally the the outcome the expected outcome of this type of uh, contracting model yeah, I, I've had this question too and it sounds like perhaps uh, hands across the border. Uh, we ought to have a, a, a dialogue between some of our federal agencies and, and you all and, uh, to the north of us because I think there's something to be learned there. It's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. And we'll take one more question and then we'll go to break. We'll come back at 11:30, so this will be a little bit shorter. Um, does the uh, I2PD contract supersede traditional methods 
and conditions contract, or is it used in conjunction with them? So in some cases, it supersedes them, right? So liability clause, for example, are radically um, operated on. Uh, claims and warranty clauses are radically operated on. Um, other clauses with respect to um, uh, you know, construction methods, engineering methods, roles and responsibilities um, are, are very similar. Um, I mean, and at the end of the day, you're still planning and executing an industrial project. So you've got to have a lot of the standard clauses in there that, that organize you uh, and, and set up the division of responsibilities for the parties to work together. So keep, think of those nine principles and you probably get an idea of which clauses uh, have to change. <laughs> 